there was a certain missionary, and this missionary was in a distant land. And this missionary was walking along a dirt country road, heading toward a small town. But this missionary was very despondent, because every missionary that had gone to that town before was not able to preach the gospel. The people of that town hardened their hearts against the gospel. So no one has been able to bring it into that town. And here was this little missionary. He's walking along. His head is bowed in prayer. And he has his Bible open in his hand. And he's walking. And he sees something out of the corner of his eye. So he stops. And he looks. And he says, oh, there's a hill. And on that hill, there's a group of baboons. Well, he knows that baboons can be extremely vicious. So he turned and put as much distance as, you know, between himself and the baboons. And he's hurrying on his way, and all of a sudden he heard the word, stop. Lord, I want you to go back to that hill and preach the gospel to the baboons. And he goes, Lord, <laughs> are you serious? The gospel is preached to man. It's not preached to animals. He said, I want you to go back, and I want you to go to that hill and preach the gospel to the baboons. So reluctantly, but obediently, he turned around, and he walked back to the hill. The baboons were still on the hill. He said, all right, listen up, baboons. Hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> he opens his Bible. He starts preaching John 3.16. He starts giving him the Romans road. He did a thorough job. And when he was done... He closed his Bible, and he starts walking away quickly. <laughs> and he got to the same place again, and the Lord said, stop. He goes, stop. Lord, I did what you wanted me to do. I preached the gospel to the baboons. My son, you didn't give them an altar call. <laughs> so reluctantly and obediently, he goes back, and the baboons were still there. And he said, all right, baboons, bow your heads and close your eyes. And he bowed his head, and he closed his eyes. And he figured he's going to give it all he's got. He gave a great altar call. And just as he was finishing, he could sense something moving closer to him. And he started getting apprehensive. He slowly opened his eyes, and the baboons were gone. But there was a group of women there. And one of the women said, we were on the other side of the hill. We were washing clothes in the water. And we heard you preaching. And we were interested, and we listened. But then you stopped, so we waited, because we didn't know what to do next. But then you came back or something, and you started preaching about how we could accept this Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we accepted him. And what we'd like, would you please come to our town? You see, we're the wives of the leaders of our town, and we know that the message that you gave to us, they need to hear. So if you would please come with us to the town, we will tell our husbands to listen to you. Well, the little missionary's like, sure, you know, and he's so surprised. So he follows them, and sure enough, they get to the town, and the ladies went up to their husbands and said, this man has something that you need to hear. This message is so important, the whole town needs to hear it. So they gathered the townspeople together, and the little missionary got in front of them and gave them to preach the gospel to them with an altar call. And all of them accepted Christ as their Savior. The gospel had come to the unreachable town because of the obedience of a little missionary. Now, I say that to tell you this. I had a message all prepared for today. And then several weeks ago, I had a devotional on a Tuesday night, and for some reason, it just set fire inside me. I said, Lord, more people have to hear this message. And the Lord said, this is the message you're going to give on November 18th, and I'm going to have my people there that need to hear it, and I am going to do a work in their lives. So with that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message that you have not only laid on my heart, but is burning inside me. 
Father, I ask that you would send forth your word with your power this morning. Let me step back and let your spirit take over. Let your spirit work among us this morning and help us to respond the way you want us to respond to your message. In Jesus' name. All of my relatives came from northern Michigan. And if you look, you know, actually there are, did you know there are three peninsulas in Michigan? We always hear about, you know, here's the, look at my hand, here's the lower peninsula where we all live. Then there's the upper peninsula. Yeah. But there's also the Keweenaw Peninsula. There's a body of water between the Keweenaw Peninsula and the upper peninsula of Michigan. And it takes a bridge to cross over to it. But in this Keweenaw Peninsula, uh, our relatives all came, both sides, mom and dad's side, all the way about three quarters of the way up the thumb here, or the rabbit ears. And uh, it's about maybe an hour, 45 minutes from the very tip of the upper peninsula of Michigan. So when I was a little girl, every summer, we would go to northern Michigan, into the Keweenaw, and visit all our relatives. And it was a long trip, let me tell you. It was a very long trip. And we would start off early in the morning, and we would get to the Straits of Mackinac. Now, the Straits are formed by two lakes, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. They come together, and they form the Straits of Mackinac. And we would get there to the Straits, and there would be this gigantic parking lot. There was no bridge. They uh, did everything by car ferry. And we would join, you know, usually there was a lot of cars. It was high tourist season. So we would get behind the last car, and we prepared to wait. And sometimes we waited for a long time, for hours, in the hot sun. But the vendors were there, and the vendors liked to really take advantage of the fact that people got hungry and they got thirsty. So they would yell out, get your smoked fish. <laughs> It was fish wrapped in paper, and you'd eat it. And then they'd say, get your ice cold pop. Well, you needed it after the smoked fish. <laughs> but my parents, they never bought anything. They were too, you know, it was too expensive. So we had our little treats, and we sat there, and we waited. And finally, the car ferry would come, our car ferry, one where we could go on. And we would board the car ferry, and while it was, you know, going to the Upper Peninsula, we would get out, and we'd get by the railing, we'd look over the waves, and do you know our minds are amazing? I can still remember the smell of that engine, of that boat. All I have to do is stop and think, and I can still remember it. But soon we would be back in the car and landed, you know, in the Upper Peninsula, and by that time of the day, it was pretty late, so we would uh, usually get a cabin for the night and then proceed on the next day. Well, it was the late 1800s when they decided maybe we should build a bridge over the Straits of Mackinac. But it took a long time and a long time planning until the mid-1900s. Yeah, 1900s. I remember which year we're in. And they finally put this plan into motion. And they planned this bridge. And the first thing they did when they started to construct it was they went down 250 feet of water until they reached bedrock the solid ground, the rock underneath the water. And then they would take and go down 210 feet into the bedrock so they se could secure this bridge. It has a very, very strong and secure foundation. This bridge is so well maintained, the mighty Mac, the Mackinac Straits Bridge. It is painted every seven years completely, and it takes seven years to completely paint it. They are constantly repairing it, constantly upgrading it. It is an absolutely beautiful bridge. If you've never seen it at night, it is spectacular. There's a lot of bridges in Michigan. And the reason why is they discovered that it is the best way to span a gap is to erect a bridge. We have the Blue Water Bridge over Lake St. Clair. We have the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit over the Detroit River. We aren't going near the tunnel because that isn't a bridge. And I don't like that tunnel. It's scary. <laughs> so where are we going with this bridge stuff? Because today, God wants to let you know that there are bridge builders. He's a bridge builder. You know, when he gave me this message, I thought, you know, Lord, if I am going to preach about bridge building, you're going to have to show me in the Bible somewhere that someone's a bridge builder. I'm thinking, oh, okay, Moses... 
And I remember sitting in church talking to him about this, and all of a sudden, now God doesn't say, duh, but that's what it felt like. Daughter, I'm a bridge builder. My son is a bridge builder. He's the one that spanned the gap between me and man. So today, we're going to take a whirlwind tour of the Old Testament all the way up to Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Now, we're not going to get real particular. We're not going to linger. We are going to do this quickly. We're not going to cover all the ways that God, our Heavenly Father, bridged the gap between himself and man, spanned a gap, reached out to man. We are going to look at some of the instances today. So fasten your seatbelt. We're going to do this quickly. And don't tell me, oh, you missed this. Well, yeah, we're not going to... You know, this message is only, I don't know how long it is. Every time I went to time it, um, I got interrupted. So we may be here for a while. <laughs> okay, so let's start. The first place to start is that God is love. That's his essence. That's his attribute. That's who he is. He is love. And because he loved, he made man to love. He made man called Adam, and he gave him a helpmate called Eve, and he put him in the garden, and a beautiful garden, and he reached out to man and he was able to fellowship with him. He was able to walk with him in the cool of the day. It was a beautiful relationship until man sinned. When man sinned, he could no longer be in the presence of God because God is holy. And he had to be cast out of the garden because not only did he sin, but the tree of life was in that garden. If he were to eat of that tree of life, he and the sin would last forever. So he was expelled from the garden I don't know how long it took for man to populate the earth. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it became populated. But man with his sin nature were evil. If you read the beginning of Genesis, you'll see what the world was like at that time. And it wasn't a backward society. It was a very progressive society. The Egyptians had nothing on the first creation of, that God made but they were evil, and God knew that he'd have to punish them. He knew not only punish them, he would have to totally destroy them. He would have to get rid of them. But he's a gracious God, and he decided to warn them. So he built a bridge, a path where they could reach him through repentance. But there was one man, and the Bible only speaks of one, only one man at that time that was following after God, and his name was Enoch. And he would walk with God. And God told him, I am going to do something. And you are going to warn my people. And you are going to have a son. And that son's name is Methuselah. Now, the interesting thing about the name Methuselah is that it's translated, when he dies, the flood will come. Now, I don't know if these people even knew what a flood was. But they knew whenever they said Methuselah, as this you know, young kid grew up into a man. Um, when he dies, the flood is going to come. You know, names meant a lot, especially then. For instance, if your name is John, it means beloved. If your name is Anne, it means grace. Now, I like my name, and I don't like nicknames because my name means gift of God, and I like when people say Dorothy. So you can call me Dorothy a lot because every time you do, it says gift of God. <laughs> so anyway, Methuselah, grew. And if the interesting thing is God is so long-suffering. Methuselah was the oldest living man ever in existence. 900 and I think 69 years or 900, yeah, 969 years he lived. And every time they said Methuselah, when he dies, the flood will come. Well, Methuselah had a son named Lamech. Lamech had a son named Noah. And Noah walked with God. It says in the Bible that he was blameless. And God spoke to Noah, and he said, you are going to warn my people, along with Methuselah, you are going to warn my people that I am going to send judgment. And I want you to build an ark. And this ark, God gave him every single detail, even the kind of wood he was going to use. And for 75 years, Noah was building this ark while the people are seeing this huge construction, and they are looking at a man who says, when I die, the flood is going to come. So they are constantly being warned by God. But did they turn? No. How sad. 
God closed the door on the ark of Noah, his family, and all the animals, and the floodwaters came and destroyed all of God's creation except Noah and his family. So Noah and his family, after the flood, started to populate the earth again. And again, we don't know how long that, take, that took. But they started to populate the earth. And when the earth was full again, it was full of, again, sinful men. But there were some men that still followed after God or, or knew God or heard of God, like Job or like Abram. Abram was a man who lived in a heathen environment, but yet he knew God. And God spoke to him. God spoke to, to Abram and said, you know, Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. You are going to be the father, father of multitudes. Your descendants will be as great as the sands of the sea. You and Sarah are going to have a child. Well, they were already up in years, and Sarah was barren. And they waited 20 years for the fulfillment of God's promise. God promised them a son, and he promised them land. Now, they made a lot of mistakes. We won't go into that. But 20 years later, when Abraham was close to 100 and Sarah close to 90, they had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had two favorite sons, the two youngest from his wife that he loved who passed away, and that was Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. But he centered in on Joseph. Now, we already see God's plan into action. He saved part of his creation from the flood. He now used Abram to start another plan going. And now we're going to look at a man named Joseph. Now, Joseph was so well-loved by his father. He gave him a coat of many colors. He honored him. He respected him. And the brothers of Joseph were furious. They were jealous especially when Joseph started having dreams, dreams of his mother and father and brothers bowing to him. Well, that, that did it. When they were out in the field, they decided we're getting rid of Joseph. So they took Joseph and they sold him to some Ishmaelites, a caravan that was going to Egypt. And then they took Joseph's coat and they dipped it in animal blood. They rubbed it in animal blood and they gave it to his father. And Jacob mourned the thought that his son was killed by a wild animal. But Joseph, God's plan in action, God's reaching out to his people, is on his way to Egypt. When he gets there, he was bought by one of Pharaoh's men called Potiphar. Potiphar bought Joseph, but God gave Joseph favor. They got along really well until Potiphar's wife noticed how handsome Joseph was. Joseph was very well built, and very handsome, and she had her eyes on him. So she tried to seduce him over and over again, and finally one day she grabbed hold of his coat, and Joseph ran, leaving the coat in her hands. Of course, a woman scorned. She took that coat to her husband, Potiphar, and said, this is the man who tried to seduce me, and I grabbed his coat as I ran away from him. Well, Joseph ended up in prison, and he was there for quite some time. This is God's plan? His man of the hours in prison, he had favor with the prison guard. And there were two men that had dreams while Joseph was in prison. There was a baker and a cupbearer. And Joseph interpreted their dreams by the power of God. He told them, he said, when you ever get released, remember me. But Joseph was there for two more years before anybody remembered Joseph. And it all happened because the Pharaoh himself had a dream. And there was nobody to interpret that dream. And the cupbearer, oh, Joseph, hey, there's a guy in prison. He interpreted dreams. They sent for Joseph, cleaned him up, brought him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told him his dream. And Joseph said, okay, this is what it is. There's going to be seven years of, of just prosperity, seven years of plenty but then it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh says, well, what do we do? And Joseph said, well, during the seven years of plenty, we are going to grow grain. We are going to store food. We are going to build storehouses to store all the food that we collect and all the grain. And then when the seven years of famine comes, we'll be totally set. Pharaoh said, okay, 
I want you to do that. I'm putting you as second in charge of all of Egypt, second in command under the Pharaoh. So Joseph did it. The first year, they grew grain, they grew crops. He stored it. The, the storehouses were bursting. But when the years of famine came, they had more than enough. And the nation started coming. They're starving. They bought grain. They bought food from, from Joseph. And one day, his brothers came. Now, they didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph knew his brothers. And he didn't reveal himself to him right away. And a lot of things transpire, but there came a day when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. They, before this, before they knew it was Joseph, they bowed before him, just like in Joseph's dream. But the brothers went and got their father. They brought all of their descendants, and they went before the Pharaoh, who gave them a land called Goshen. And they were well cared for there. They had plenty to eat. They had fields for their sheep. It was a very fine piece of, piece of land. And they multiplied. They grew in great number. Joseph died, his brothers died, and the Pharaoh died. By this time, the Hebrews, the Ish, Ish, wee, <laughs> Israelites, I'll get it out, numbered close to two million people. They were growing. But this Pharaoh didn't want them to grow. He didn't want to remember all that Joseph did. What he did, he started making life really difficult for these Hebrews. He just worked them so hard, he put them into slavery. And then he had this idea, I'm going to get rid of them. Every male baby that is born is going to die of the Hebrews. And every child, every male child, two years and under, are going to die. I'm going to put them to death. Well, there was a tiny baby that was born. His parents loved him very much and didn't want him to die. His name was Moses. See, Joseph had been God's plan to save his people and put them in a place where they would be safe from the famine, that they wouldn't die out. But now that there was a problem, little baby jo Moses was born, and his parents, they watched. They knew that every day the Pharaoh's daughter would come down to the water and bathe. So they put Moses in a little basket. They lined it with pitch so that it wouldn't leak water and sent his sister with him to watch over him. And sure enough, the Pharaoh's daughter came down. She saw Moses. She took him in her arms. She took him home. She raised him as her own with all the privileges and all the, the wealth of the Egyptians. It was the Pharaoh's son. Well, this son grew. And it's interesting because, you know, who gave him knowledge of his past? Surely not Pharaoh's daughter. But one day when he was grown, he saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew, and he went ballistic. He killed the Egyptian, and then he thought, uh-oh, I better get out of here. So he left Egypt, and he ran into the desert of Midian, and he married there. He had a couple children, worked for his father-in-law, and he was there until he was an old man, probably in his 80s. But one day, God had his sights on Moses. Moses was part of his plan to reach his people. He spoke to Moses out of a burning bush, and he said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him that I want my people to be let go. So Moses and Aaron went to Egypt. They went before the Pharaoh and said, God, the God of the Israelites wants you to let his people go. Well, you know, that went over like a ton of bricks. Nothing happened. So God had planned on these plagues, but every plague that came upon Egypt, the Pharaoh would harden his heart and say, no, you are not going to go out of Egypt. You are not going to worship your God. You are not going to take your people out of this city, out of this town, um, place. But finally, the last plague was the death of the firstborn, and that was enough. And Pharaoh said, get out of here. Take all your people, all your animals, everything you own, and leave. And go make your sacrifices to your God. So they did. A mass exodus of two million plus people. But then Pharaoh's heart turned again. And he set off his great army and all his chariot drivers. And he sent them after the Israelites. The Israelites were led 
by Moses, who was led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he took them all the way to the Red Sea. And at the Red Sea, the people said, now what are we going to do? You brought us out of Egypt for this so we can die here in front of this sea that we can't cross? But the pillar of cloud moved all the way behind those millions of people and blocked the view of the Egyptians. And he parted the Red Sea so his people could go through. God again had a plan, reaching out for his people, saving them from certain death. The cloud lifted and the Egyptians saw what was happening and they followed the Israelites into the water and the water came over them and they drowned the whole of Pharaoh's army. Okay, so now God's people are past the Red Sea. They just saw amazing miracles. They were delivered from bondage. You see, the interesting thing is, when they were in Egypt and they were under such cruel torture and torment, they cried out to God. You know, they would have been totally content to remain in Egypt for the rest of their life until things got hard and they called out to God. God had to have a plan to get them out of Egypt. If their lives were soft, nothing would have changed. This was all his plan. God is amazing. So now they're there, and the first thing that God did, beside providing them with manna, water from a rock, and even quail, listening to them complain daily that, oh, I wish I was back in Egypt. Ugh. But he called Moses up on the mountain. He said, look, i got to give you a plan here. I'm going to give you ten commandments that my people have got to live by. And I'm going to have you build and construct a tabernacle. And I'm going to give all the people that are going to work on it, I'm going to give them the ability to do exactly what I said. Just as much as God told Noah how to build that ark, he told Moses how to build that tabernacle. And you know why? Because he wanted to dwell among his people. He was reaching out to them. But while he was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, the people were getting restless. And you know what happened. Where is that Moses? Who's going to lead us away from this mountain? We need a God. We need a God that's going to take us out of here. Aaron, make us a God. And they brought him all their gold, all their jewelry. And Moses cast a calf out of gold an animal that eats grass, and they worshiped this thing. This, this golden calf wasn't going to take them anywhere. It couldn't even walk. It couldn't think. It couldn't do anything, and they worshiped him. They sprawled on it. They did all manner of hideous things, and they praised him more than they ever praised the God of heaven. And God on the mountain said to Moses, your people are going, well, they're out of control down there. You need to go down and see, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to start a nation out of you. Moses went down, the commandments in his hands, and he saw what was happening, and he threw them down, crushed them. And he said, who among you is for God? And the only people that came forward the, were the Levites. He says, strap on your swords and start killing the people. 3,000 people died before God stopped. Eventually, Moses was back up on the mountain, and he got the Ten Commandments again. And then God, reaching out to his people, giving them a knowledge of sin, gave them the law. Now the people knew what sin was. They knew that when something, someone sinned, something would have to die. He gave them the sacrificial offering system. So now the people were without excuse. They knew what God demanded of them. They knew what was right, and they knew what was wrong. And they knew that if they sinned, an animal would have to die. Do you think they learned their lesson? No. What happened is they got worse. They wouldn't obey God. And finally, God said, that's it. This generation is not going to see the land that I promised Abraham. And so he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation had gone and a new generation came. But in the meantime, Moses died and a new leader Joshua was in charge of the nation of Israel, the people of God. And the first order of business was God told Joshua, Joshua, 
It's time. We're going into the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They crossed the Jordan, and the first thing they saw was a walled city called Jericho. Its walls were impenetrable. They were so thick you could ride a chariot on top of them and build houses in it. They thought they were the securest place that nothing, nothing could possibly come into their city. Well, before they got near it, Joshua met up with a pre-incarnate um, visit from the Lord Jesus Christ, the commander of the Lord's army, and he said, Joshua, these are your instructions. These are your marching orders. You obey me. And he did. He took 40,000 men, the Ark of the Covenant. He took praisers with ram's horns, and they marched around Jericho for six days. They just marched around it, this huge city, and then they left. Now, the people who are in Jericho and the leaders, they were watching this. They knew these people. They'd heard about these people that belonged to a God who could part the Red Sea, a God who, God who could perform miracles. They could see from their vantage point over the Jordan, they could see the tabernacle with the fire at night and the cloud by day. They were frightened, apprehensive. And yet these people, they just marched around and left until the seventh day. When they marched around and they stopped and they shouted and God took his hand and crushed that impenetrable city and the walls came down, they destroyed Jericho. And now, yes, and now they had entrance into the promised land. Oh, there would be battles to be fought, yes. But God's people, man, they're kind of like us, you know? One day you're doing good, one day you're failing. But they were ridiculous. They would rather serve an idol. They would rather worship the nations around them, the things that they worshiped. Finally, they said, give us a king. But before he gave them a king, he gave them judges. And these judges would help them in battle, tell them what God wanted them to hear. But they still wanted a king. So God gave them a king of their choosing. And then he gave them a king of his choosing. And these kings went good, bad, good, bad, all the way through. And sometime after about the third or fourth king, the whole nation divided into a north and southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. Israel was not serving God at all. And finally, God said, I'm sending prophets. I'm warning my people. I'm giving them a bridge that they could repent and come back to me. But they wouldn't do it. So he said, okay, I'm getting the Assyrians to come and take you into exile. My people are better off in exile than they are here serving other gods and not even knowing who I am. And then for 100 years, through prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk, he warned the southern kingdom, you are going to face judgment if you don't turn and repent and stop doing what you're doing. I remember Habakkuk crying out to him, God, you see what's happening? Your courts are a mess. The tabernacle's in, in, in ruins. Your, your people are serving other gods. What are you going to do? God said, I'm going to do something, Habakkuk. I'm going to take them and put them into exile under the Babylonians. And he did. But he also told them, I'll restore them. I'll bring them back one day. And one day came, and the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And the second Persian king was named Cyrus, and he allowed the people to go back to their land and rebuild their temple and to serve their God. Now the people, again, they had their problems. But there came a time where there was 400 years of silence, 400 years where there was not a voice of a prophet. During that time rose the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Greeks conquered Persia, and the Greek language came to the forefront. The Romans conquered the Greeks. And finally, after 400 years, the voice of a prophet was heard in the form of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist announced the coming of the Messiah. Jesus Christ was born 
fulfillment of prophecy. He was born of a virgin. He entered into his public ministry at the age of 30. He preached the kingdom of God. He performed miracles, healings. He taught the people that he did only what the Father did, and he revealed the Father to them. But there was one purpose that Jesus Christ had in coming, and that was to die. He was the perfect Lamb of God. He came to die for the sins of the people. In the Old Testament, when someone sinned, an animal had to die. And that animal's blood covered the sin so God would not destroy the people. But Jesus Christ came as the perfect Lamb of God. If anybody ever tells you that Jesus was made sin, you cast that thought out of your mind. That is wrong. Jesus Christ, in the Greek, it says he was a sin offering. That lamb in the Old Testament was not made sin, and either was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he was the perfect spotless lamb who died on the cross in our place and took the punishment for our sins upon himself. And when he was on that cross, Jesus Christ took the Father's hand and he took man's hand and he joined them together and he made a way for man to reach God. The ultimate bridge, the ultimate spanning of the gap between heaven and earth, the cross of Jesus Christ. Why bridges? Why today? God had this message planned. You see, God is concerned about the gaps in relationships in your life. Because gaps cause bitterness and hurt and unforgiveness and frustration. There are all sorts of gaps. Divorce causes a gas, gap, and the fallout from a divorce can be terrible, it can be horrible. It far-reaching estrangement. People's lives are changed. There's gaps in our families. We have loved ones that we haven't talked to in years because of somebody who hurt somebody. You might have a son or a daughter that lives with you that you no longer have a relationship with. Something has changed. Maybe that child is not is abusive, has no respect for you, and you can't reach him. Maybe you have loved ones that you've been praying for for years and years and years, and you see nothing happening. And there's a gap between God and them because they don't know him. Or maybe one of your children has wandered away from God after years of serving him, and your heart is broken. Maybe you live in a family that you're the only ones that's saved and nobody else could care less and every morning you wake up and you say God another day of this I don't know what to do anymore I don't know how to fix this there's a gap here and my people are going to perish maybe it's a work situation maybe you've been hurt maybe you're going through an illness or you've just had one too many things coming against you and you're really down and you're ready to give up. Well, God has a building block, and it's called prayer. Oh, I know. Prayer is the most underestimated power there is. And Satan will do anything, anything to discourage you from prayer. He will make you think that it's not working. He will make you think that, oh, you don't need to bother. God's not even listening to you. Look, he hasn't done anything. But that's the building block that God says will repair the gaps in your life, that will get you through the situation that you're in, that will take you from the place that you are piled down with every type of worry and fear and stress and bring you through. Oh, but I've prayed for my relatives for years and years, and I see nothing happening. Nothing is being accomplished. Nothing. Who says there's nothing? 
God doesn't. How can you say that your prayers are not effective when you are co-working, co-laboring with the God of the universe? That's just plain ridiculous. God wants you to know today that your prayers are not only working, but they're availing. He has to work in the lives of people with free wills. Well, how long is it going to take? How long did it take between Adam and the cross? God's the author of time. We aren't. We can't fix anything. Only he can. How long did it take you? How many years did someone pray for you to get saved? 11 years for me. A couple that I knew prayed for 11 years. And when I came to the Lord, they rejoiced with me. Today, God wants to do something. This message isn't by accident, and you're not here by accident. He wants you to be encouraged. He wants you to persevere like Paul said. I labor. I labor in prayer with all the energy God gives me for the saints. Do you know that when you pray, God energizes you? Today, he wants you to come forward. You may have a relationship with God that is going through a dry period. The Bible doesn't seem to have enough spark in it anymore. Prayer, you just, you don't do it. Fellowship with God, oh yeah, maybe in passing. There's no passion. He's going to restore that today.